This uh, map is one that you've already uh, seen this morning. It uh, shows you uh, the CERN uh, member states and some of the uh, surrounding countries in Europe. Uh, I am going to talk not just about particle physics, uh, also, as has been promised, a little bit about the connection between particle physics and cosmology. This is really a sort of appetizer for what you'll hear later on, in particular, from uh, Pierre Benetri. But I do want to say a little bit about uh, the impact of uh, CERN on science and society. Uh, this will reflect some of the remarks that were made by Professor Kulikowski in his introduction, and also some of those that were made by Chris Welland Smith in the previous talk. Uh, but I will, if you like, give you some worked examples of how these arguments have uh, panned out in the case of particle physics. It's perhaps a good idea to uh, start back at the beginning. Uh, next week, in fact, will be the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, start of the CERN organization. In fact, uh, the CERN convention was signed the previous year. Uh, this is actually a, a copy of the uh, convention paper, which uh, has signatories from uh, 12 countries on it. Uh, of those 12 countries, 11 are still members of CERN. Uh, there is one which doesn't exist anymore, namely Yugoslavia. So uh, here are the CERN member states, which you've uh, seen uh, repeatedly. When CERN started back in 1954, there was no European Union. The European Union came along later. Uh, when countries from uh, Central Europe, such as Poland, joined CERN starting in 1991, they were not admitted to the European Union. I'm very happy that this is possible this year, but in many respects, CERN has been pioneering European integration, and as I will say later on, also global integration in science. So uh, Poland in particular, as you've already heard, became a member state of CERN in 1991, which was somehow the culmination of a, a long and very uh, valuable relationship that we had with Poland also many years previously. Now one of the points that I'm going to be making later on is that uh, CERN is not quote unquote, just a European organization. Uh, I would argue that uh, CERN is the first global scientific organization. It's a global European organization. Uh, as Professor Le Smith has already mentioned, there are scientists from something like 80 countries working at CERN. Uh, we have official agreements with the governments of more than 30 countries around the world, not just the United States, Russia and Japan, but also, in particular, many developing countries such as uh, India. So what are all these people doing? Why are they doing it? And why is it important that they do it? Uh, Chris Wellen smith has given you some very general arguments. What I will do in the rest of this talk is review a bit the history of particle physics and, of course, in particular, uh, CERN's contributions, some of CERN's contributions to particle physics. As I go through this uh, historical review, I will mention some specific uh, interfaces with cosmology, such as the origin of matter, the origin of the nuclei in the universe, uh, perhaps dark matter. Uh, but I won't go into great detail, and these, these will be discussed by subsequent speakers. And I will spend, as I said, a fair amount of time discussing various aspects of the impact of CERN on society. Uh, information technology is one example of this. Uh, you all know, it's already been said this morning, that uh, CERN, people working at CERN invented the World Wide Web. And uh, we're currently working on an extension of this called the grid, which will enable the sharing of computer resources around the world. The World Wide Web had an immense impact on world society. Uh, maybe the grid will also. But there are other ways in which uh, the work at CERN has impacted society. Uh, for example, medical physics, uh, education, training has already been mentioned. So these topics I will also bring out during the course of my talk. So I'll start off with uh, an introduction to particle physics. And uh, this map you've also seen this morning. Uh, the uh, red ring there is the uh, layout of the main CERN accelerator, the LHC, which is currently under construction, uh, 27 kilometers in circumference. 
uh, just to convince you that it really is big, uh, you can see the runway of Geneva Airport in the background, which looks rather small. So what is all this to do? Basically, you can regard accelerators such as CERNs as being immense microscopes for looking inside matter. Uh, we know that uh, every piece of matter is made up out of the same basic Lego building blocks. If you think back a century ago, this is the time when people finally realized that atoms were in fact not the fundamental building blocks and that atoms in fact were composite objects containing nuclei with electrons orbiting around them. During the first half of the, of the last century, it was realized that these nuclei were also complicated objects made up out of protons and neutrons. In the second half of the last century, it was realized that these protons and neutrons were made up out of smaller constituents, smaller building blocks called quarks. And it's these quarks which is one aspect of the uh, frontier of our present knowledge of the structure of matter. I would say that the, the core business of CERN is to understand what these basic buildings, blocks of matter are and the interactions between them. What are the forces holding these uh, fundamental constituents together? This is the core business of CERN. And when I talk later on about uh, applications to medical physics and information technology, these should be regarded as subsidiary benefits of CERN, but not the reason why CERN should exist. So if you go back to the 19th century, uh, the picture of matter was extremely complicated. Here is the uh, Mendeleev table, and uh, our friends over at uh, Dubna continually make this Mendeleev table even more complicated by discovering new super heavy elements. Fortunately, uh, fundamental science is somewhat simpler than this nuclear table. As I've already mentioned, we know that all these uh, elements are made out of atoms with nuclei that contain protons and neutrons. And as I've already emphasized, the primary business of CERN is to study the constituents inside these protons and neutrons. I've emphasized this point because, of course, the name CERN, the N, is nuclear. And people often think, well, it's nuclear physics. It, there is a small amount of nuclear physics that is done at CERN, but this is no longer our core business. Another aspect of the core business of CERN is to study these fundamental forces and provide the basis as far as possible for theories unifying them all. And I think one can say that over the decades of CERN's existence, it's made important contributions to our understanding of electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and to the unification between them. If you look back over the history of particle physics, uh, one can say that in some sense, uh, it started uh, back at the end of the 19th century with the discovery of the electron. But in the first half of the last century, uh, a lot of the fundamental advances in particle physics were made with cosmic rays. Uh, following Hess, people went up in balloons, they went to the top of mountains, they discovered all sorts of strange, literally strange particles coming down in the cosmic rays. But it was realized, first of all by the Americans and subsequently by the Europeans, uh, around 1950, that if you wanted to make any progress in the systematic understanding of these particles and their interactions, then you needed to build large accelerators, of which CERN is the largest example. So it was this realization that you had to move to uh, accelerators where you could do controlled experiments under controlled experimental conditions, which led in Europe to the foundation of CERN in 1954, as I've already mentioned. So what are the landmarks in particle physics? Well, uh, particle physicists could go on for hours about all the landmarks. I just picked out one slide of landmarks. So the discovery of the electron by Thomson, the discovery of the nucleus by Rutherford. Then I fast forward quarks. 
quarks is the next layer of uh, matter inside the protons and neutrons. And everybody knows that uh, quarks were proposed by Gell-Mann. What's perhaps forgotten is that at the same time, aces, which are the same thing, were proposed by Zweig, who at that time was working at CERN. In the 1970s, experimental evidence for quarks came, first in experiments at SLAC, but also in experiments at CERN. And uh, in fact, it was the experiments at CERN combined with the experiments in the United States at SLAC that confirmed the quantum numbers of the quarks uh, using a sum rule which was derived by Professor Llewellyn Smith. Perhaps one of the key breakthroughs at CERN uh, was made in 1973 with the discovery of a new type of radioactivity that I'll discuss a bit more in a, in a moment, the discovery of the so-called neutral weak interactions. Uh, this created the revolution which gave us a completely new understanding of, uh, of the fundamental forces and paved the way for a calculable unified theory of the particle interactions. A key step in the verification of this theory was the discovery of the particles analogous to the photon that carry the weak interactions. And these were discovered in very famous experiments conducted at CERN in 1983, led by Carlo Rubia. In the 1990s, uh, this theory of particle physics, this theory of matter and its interactions, was confirmed and established and verified to a high degree of precision in experiments done at the LEP accelerator at CERN, which was the previous accelerator in that red tunnel that you saw earlier on, which is now being filled by the LHC. Now, you may say, well, isn't this story going to go on forever? Of course, it's not going to go on forever because I only have two more lines on this transparency. Uh, the next line is the last quark which was discovered in the United States uh, we at CERN would say on the basis of predictions made possible by our data, we say, well, okay, if there's the last quark and if you've discovered all the uh, carriers of the weak interactions, what else is there left to do? And uh, one of my jobs uh, towards the end of this talk will be to convince you that there is something else to do, which is to explore why particles weigh. And I'm going to try to at least give you a flavor of why this is an important thing to do, and Professor Feltes later on will describe the experiments which are actually going to do it. All these particles and their interactions are collectively described by something which we call uh, unglamorously the standard model of particle physics. And I think it's worth recalling that uh, one of the proponents of the standard model came from a small village in Pakistan, namely Abdus Salam. And uh, Chris Rowland Smith was uh, saying earlier on that he thinks it's important that developing countries also be involved in basic research. Many developing government governments around the world understand this and send their scientists to collaborate with CERN, uh, some of them inspired by Abdul Salam. I already mentioned that some of the key experiments uh, verifying the standard model have been done at CERN. And uh, in fact, the very accurate results that have been obtained seem to be in very perfect agreement with the standard model theory, which of course is very unfortunate. I think uh, we would be much happier if our previous experiments had found there was something wrong with our standard model and given us a clue of which direction to go next. But uh, for the moment, the direction in which to go next is largely theoretical speculation. Okay, so I, I've given you some sort of general panorama of particle physics, and I've given you some sort of flavor of what CERN has been able to contribute to this. Now let me say something more about some specific CERN contributions. So uh, you've already seen the picture in the top right-hand part of this slide, which was uh, the construction site of CERN, obviously before construction started, uh, the picture at the top left shows you the uh, distinguished people who uh, decided to set up CERN. The picture at the bottom left shows you what was perhaps uh, 
CERN's first major result. Uh, this is an experiment which was done back in the 1950s, which was one of the key experiments which laid the basis for the theory of the weak force. At that time, there were a number of contradictory experimental results which seemed to go against the best theoretical ideas of the time. And one of the first key experiments done at CERN was to say the theorists are right, those other experiments somehow got it wrong. The bottom right-hand panel is also a landmark in the history of CERN. Uh, this was 1959, a date that Professor Kulikowski already mentioned. This is when CERN's first major accelerator uh, was completed, and uh, for a while it uh, held the world's energy record as the highest energy accelerator. The discovery of the uh, neutral weak interactions that I mentioned uh, was made in 1973 uh, using a, a bubble chamber where you uh, look for the particle tracks as they pass through the bubbles and uh, create uh, ionization. Uh, the top left picture shows you white-coated technicians inside the bubble chamber. Uh, the top right-hand picture shows you white-coated technicians working on the magnet outside the bubble chamber. Uh, I don't think we have white-coated technicians anymore. This was a sort of 1950s, 1960s tradition which has uh, evaporated. Uh, the two lower pictures are taken with the bubble chamber and these mark the actual discovery of this new form of uh, interaction. Uh, in the bottom left-hand picture, uh, a neutrino, which you can't see, hits an electron, and this was a completely uh, novel type of interaction which had not been seen before. Uh, the bottom right-hand side is uh, another type of analogous interaction, where in this case a neutrino hits a nucleus, and previously when that had happened, people had seen an electron or a muon coming out. This was the first time when no such electron or muon appeared. So as I've already said, this was a new form of weak interaction, a new form of radioactivity, which uh, opened the way to setting up the standard model. There's not so many different types of fundamental interaction. Right? Electromagnetism, gravity, the strong force, the weak force. So to discover a new type of interaction, I think, is a really a major landmark in physics. And I believe that this discovery would have been marked by a Nobel Prize if it had not been for the fact that the principal people involved in setting up this experiment died prematurely. You may say, what do neutral weak interactions have to do with the rest of the universe? Well, very possibly, they're responsible for the fact that we exist because there is a general belief that these neutral weak interactions play a crucial role in making supernova explosions possible, in pushing out the, if you like, debris which is produced by the star. So there's these neutral current interactions that push out the debris. And uh, these are, in fact, recent simulations taken from a paper by uh, Janka et al. that verify that uh, one can make supernova explosions happen with the benefit of these neutral weak interactions. So if these interactions didn't exist, supernovae might not send out their debris into the cosmos, in which case heavy elements would not exist, and neither would we. Many of the subsequent developments in particle physics were made possible by this gentleman, Georges Scharpach, who was born in Poland. He, uh, in 1968, perfected a revolutionary type of uh, electronic detector which completely superseded the bubble chambers that were being used previously. These were things which could be connected directly to computers, which could take data at very high event rates and provide much more data than had ever been possible previously. The first applications of these were, of course, to particle physics, but subsequently, Sharpak himself uh, made a lot of applications of this also to medical physics. The next major discovery, which was made possible in particular by these uh, chambers of Sharpak, was the discovery of the W and the Z particle, the carrier particles of the weak interactions. Uh, 
there's not so many different types of carrier particles around, right? There's the photon, which is basically postulated by Einstein in 1905. Uh, there's the gluon, similar thing for the uh, strong interactions, which was uh, discovered in 1979 in Hamburg following a, a suggestion made at CERN. And there's the W and the Z, the carrier particles of the weak interactions, which were uh, discovered as a result of an initiative led by Carlo Rubia made possible by Simon van der Meer. And uh, in the top part of this picture, you see the tracks of the W and Z particles in electronic detectors of the type invented by Sharpak. And uh, in the bottom, you see the energies produced by the decays of the W and the Z particles. So you see these uh, towers of Lego bricks, which uh, correspond to the decays of the W and the Z. In fact, at one time, CERN got into a dispute with the Lego toy company because they said we couldn't talk about Lego plots. This is a trademark. So let me just uh, show you uh, some Nobel Prize winners associated with CERN. Uh, the first one is uh, Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer, the people who discovered the W and the Z. Here is a picture of uh, Georges Schaupach, uh, the inventor of the uh, electronic detectors. Uh, actually, the person in the back there is another P Nobel Prize winner, San Ting, who has been doing experiments at CERN for many years. And I've been trying to identify the person on the right. I think it may be the back of Carlo Rubia's head, but I'm not absolutely sure. And then I've added these people. Uh, these were uh, Veltman and Atoft, who were the people who showed how one could calculate in our modern theories of particle physics, and who actually laid the mathematical basis for the standard model. These people both worked at CERN for a number of years, and it was experiments at CERN that verified the predictions of the standard model that showed that their calculations worked, and the Nobel Prize citation for Veltman and Tuft <coughs> makes extensive reference to the work at CERN, which confirmed their predictions. I, I talked about the experiments that verified the standard model. Uh, on the left here is uh, one, the results from one of the experiments at CERN measuring the properties of the W and the Z particle with the LEP accelerator. One of the key results of these experiments was that it was possible for the first time to determine how many different types of matter particles could possibly exist. In particular, in this case, the number of different types of neutrinos. Uh, and you can see very clearly that the number is three. So you may say, why do I care that there's only three neutrinos? Wouldn't the universe have been the same if there'd been six or 10? The answer is no, the universe would not have been the same because the number of different types of elementary particles, and in particular, the numbers of different types of neutrinos control the behavior of the very early universe. So in some sense, you can say that experiments at CERN are going back in history through the Big Bang. And the way in which the universe behaved in those very early days controls the abundances of the light elements in the universe. I talked earlier about the role of neutral currents in spreading heavy elements through the universe. The abundances of the light elements, such as helium-4, deuterium, and uh, lithium, those are controlled by nuclear reactions in the very early history of the universe, which depend on the number of neutrino species. And in fact, the observations are in very good agreement with the measurements from LEP that tell us that there are just precisely three different types of neutrinos and by extension, three different types of uh, other sorts of elementary particles. Another experiment done at CERN which has some uh, bearing on cosmology is experiments on the properties of uh, matter and antimatter. Uh, originally, when antimatter was postulated, it was thought that its properties would be precisely equal and opposite to those of regular matter. It turns out that they're not quite equal and opposite. Uh, and the results on the right-hand side, which are too technical to understand, except to a particle physicist, don't worry, 
the important thing is that these experiments show that, in fact, even in the decays of matter and antimatter particles, there are very small differences. And it's believed that these very small differences between the decays of matter and antimatter particles might have made possible the fact that the universe today is predominantly made of matter and contains no measurable amounts of antimatter.